What's good with the YouTube with Convict's Perspective? It's your boy, Big Flacco. Back from the airport after an 18-hour delay, man. Had to clean up, guys, after you guys see me on live the other day. I'm with my co-host, Big Senor Rojo. And as always, with a little bit of energy, man. What's cracking, everybody? So, um, Rojo's going to get straight to it, man. We got an interesting article about a, uh, a past correctional officer being killed at Chino State Prison. And I remember this because I was in the system when this occurred. And what ended up happening was, is they ended up locking down every prison at that time based upon this killing. Yeah, you know, I know you guys have heard us before when we've talked about, you know, problems between guards and inmates and, and me and Flacco have both mentioned how the Crips, the Crips in particular, they seem to put up with less. I, for, for no other better way to say it, they seem to put up less you know, when, when it comes to their interactions with the guards as perceived disrespect, you know, um, I've seen it firsthand just in verbal stuff, you know, they'll, they'll escalate real quick from a simple, you know, something that could be talked about to a real fast. You know what I mean? The Crips don't mess around with the guards. I don't know what it is. I don't know if that's something they got, you know, as a, as a group, Hey, we don't play this stuff. And, and don't take nothing that you perceive any kind of way, but who knows, man. But this is an older article, man. This is from 2006, man. But it just goes in line with what we're saying about inmate reactions with staff and how different groups mingle. Northerners don't say much. You know, Crips want to fight. You know, Serenios do what they do. But anyway, here we go. This is courtesy of prisonlegalnews.org. And it is by uh, Marvin Mentor. A prison guard at the California Institute for Men at Chino was stabbed to death in the Sycamore Hall housing unit on January 10th, 2005 by an East Coast Crips gang affiliated prisoner who had just begun a 75 years to life three strikes enhanced sentence for the attempted murder of a Los Angeles peace officer. So he, he, this guy doesn't like it. he doesn't like it. This was the first murder of a guard by a state prisoner in California in 20 years. All 33 prisons and many county jails were locked down for one day. Governor Schwarzenegger ordered Capitol flags lowered to half mast. Guard Manuel A. Gonzalez Jr., 43, died from three stab wounds to chest and abdomen that were allegedly inflicted by John Blaylock, 35 years old. Using a prison-made weapon, Blaylock was allegedly assisted by fellow prisoners Keith White and Henry Riley when he attacked Gonzalez from behind. Gonzalez was not wearing a protective vest because CIM had received only 352 of its order for 900 of the $500 vests. None were issued pending receipt of the balance. You like how oh, he said that? Say again? They only received 352 of the of the of the 900 of the $500 vest. Trying to blame it on funding. Oh yeah, for sure. You know they can. They, yeah, that that's that's a that's a that's a a non-direct way to ask for more money right there. Like oh, we got to address this officer safety. I get it. You know whatever. However, it is uncertain whether a vest would have saved Gonzalez's life. Blaylock is now fighting for his own life. San Bernardino County District Attorney Michael Ramos is seeking the death penalty for Gonzalez's murder. Four formal inquiry boards were convened to investigate the killing. Separate reports were issued by the San Bernardino County Sheriff, the California Office of Inspector General, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and by a national, national panel of experts appointed by former Corrections Secretary Roderick Hickman. The latter panel was chaired by New York DOC Commissioner Glenn S. Gord. One area of inquiry raised by officials with California Prison Guards Union was why none of the protective vests were issued until the purchaser, until the purchase order had been filed. CIM Warden Lori DiCarlo indicated that it was a fairness issue raised by the union itself, i.e., who would be favored if only some staff could be outfitted with vests. A second concern lay with the fact that Blaylock was a maximum security level four prisoner who was being held at a level three reception center until his custody placement was resolved. Blaylock claimed to have enemies at Corcoran State Prison where he was initially slated to go and begged off his earlier transfer. 
He reportedly had medical and mental conditions, including suicide attempts that required special placement. Blaylock was hoping to go to the California Medical Facility, a level three prison. Meanwhile, he remained at CIM for seven months where his security restrictions were lower than the maximum security level expected for someone with his criminal history and, no, and known assaultive nature. Guards are safe, prisoners are not. CCPOA President Mike Jimenez blamed Gonzalez, blamed Gonzalez is slaying on a prisoner coddling culture allegedly installed by former CDCR Security Secretary Hickman and comprised the workplace safety of, and compromised the workplace safety of guards. Indeed, on May 6, 2006, Michael Watson, a mentally unstable prisoner at New Folsom Sacramento facility, who was unhappy over losing his job in the kitchen, <laughs> took guard Sheila Mitchell hostage for 10 hours using a prison-made knife. The incident ended peacefully through negotiations, but statistically, California guards have suffered far fewer workplace homicides than of other classes of workers. With one murder in 20 years, the CDCR's average annual workplace homicide rate computes to about 0.25 deaths per year per 100,000 guards. This compares favorably with taxi cab drivers, 26.9 homicides per 100,000 drivers a year, detectives 5.0, and justice public order workers 3.4. The average rate for CDCR guards is one third of that for workers in all professions, 0 0.7, according to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. To be sure, Prisoners have much greater on-the-job homicide risk. For example, 50 prisoners were shot to death by CDCR guards from 1986 to 2004, some of which were reported as staged blood sport fights, which we just discussed recently. Only one of the shootings involved an escape. Other prisoners have died after altercation with guards, including being pepper sprayed. And according to findings of fact in Plata for Schwarzenegger, a class action lawsuit over healthcare and CDCR facilities, on average, a California prisoner needlessly dies every six to seven days due to grossly deficient medical treatment. Ooh. Did you hear them numbers? I'm gonna say That's this one more time for you guys. This is what this is what I used to do with. I don't know medical now. This is what Flacco had to go through and all the people from our era and before. On average. A California prisoner needlessly dies every six to seven days due to grossly deficient medical treatment. That's a story in itself right there, man. No guards did any time for these killings. No special commissions were convened. The respective governors at the time didn't concern themselves with dozens of prisoner deaths, but when new Folsom level four prisoner Matthew Ormsby stripped a protective vest off a guard in March 2004 in an attempted stabbing that only resulted in minor injuries, he was sentenced to 89 years to life. On November 30th of 04, a guard at New Folsom fatally shot prisoner Wade Shiflett in the back while Shiflett was stabbing another prisoner on B Yard. And on August 27th of 04, California men's colony prisoner Anthony Brown stopped breathing two hours after being pepper sprayed by a guard he had elbowed. However, one thing is certain, the results of the investigation into Gonzalez's murder will be closely watched by his surviving family members. Their attorneys, John A. Ferrone and Michael Beacock have already filed suit against CIM officials and CDCR, alleging misconduct and failing to provide adequate safety for Gonzalez. During a post-murder search of Sycamore Hall, officials discovered 35 stabbing and slashing instruments some rusted with age and secreted in toilets and traps. Within days after Gonzalez's death, the 352 protective vests held in the CIM warehouse were quietly issued. All of a sudden, they had been in storage for four months plus. Two initial investigative reports on Gonzalez's January 10, 2005 murder, which revealed failed leadership, resulted in CIM warden Lori DiCarlio and two guards being placed on administrative leave by then CDCR Secretary Hickman. Further disciplinary actions are expected. Hickman's initial findings uncovered serious management deficiencies. First, the alleged killer John Playlock not being placed in his appropriate custody level during his seven months at Chino. 
Blaylock's history of assaulting staff and others while known in the prison's classification committee was essentially ignored in the four reviews. Blaylock, in and out of prison since 1990, had recently re was recently reincarcerated for the attempted murder of a Los Angeles peace officer. He had a classification score of 376 points. It's a lot. Only 52 points are needed to require maximum security level four placement. With documented mental health problems, Blaylock had over 20 citations for violence to staff, as well as other prisoners, including possession and use of weapons. Nonetheless, he was placed in the general population, which put him in daily open contact with both staff and other inmates alike. He stabbed a prisoner on July 31st, 2004, but was returned to the general population on September 22nd of that year. Two months for stabbing. No, see, that's probably an allegation, though, because we both know if he was found guilty, he would have got a shoot term. I'm going to elaborate when we're done, man. This article is kind of, there's some key points in this article that make you wonder. Yeah, it, it kind of wanders a little bit, but they, they all they coincide are, to the fact that... Are, are you getting to that, too? Like, it seems like, for, for a minute, it seems like they're pro-correction officers and staff trying to cover them. And it then later like on, it feels like... Sides. It seems like they switch sides, like they're trying yeah. to expose them. I'm getting, I was kind of thinking the same thing right now. Yeah, no doubt. CIM staff did not tighten security after a riot and a series of stabbings between December 6, 04, and January 9th of 05 in response to a December 28th stabbing. Blaylock, a reputed shot caller for black prisoners, specifically the Crips, told guards that prisoners blamed staff for permitting the attack and wanted to get the responsible guards. No warden level review of this threat was ever conducted. Further, the murder guard, Manuel Gonzalez, routinely let Blaylock out of a cell to move on the tier unsupervised. On the day he was killed, Gonzalez violated procedures by releasing Blaylock from the cell while leaving the grill gate and front door open. That was when Blaylock attacked him. Such violations during Gonzalez's second watch period were reportedly commonplace. A March, two, a March 16, 2005 report by the state inspector general revealed lax inventory controls that permitted prisoners easy access to tools with which to manufacture weapons. Daily tool inventory records were obviously falsified as having been checked off during a 20-day period when the tools had either been seized as evidence or other misplacements. Check boxes on tool inventory forms were suspiciously signed by the same pen, appearing to have been done after the fact by one person. Facility disrepair and poor building maintenance provided prisoners with a ready supply of raw materials for making weapons. The IG's inspection found unsecured tools in a five-gallon bucket, unsecured lockers containing welding rods and propane cylinders, and numerous unsecured bins containing non-inventoried replacement parts kept on hand for electrical and plumbing repairs. Broken windows permitted prisoners to pass contraband from cell to cell. Required daily cell searches were not performed. The IG report noted that Blaylock was inappropriately housed on the general population and that Gonzalez and other guards frequently violated set security protocols by letting such violent prisoners run loose. Following Gonzalez's murder, the prison's clinic was found to be ill-prepared to handle emergency medical needs with key supplies such as defibrillators, oxygen, and airway relief equipment kept in different locked closets in separate rooms. Indeed, the prison's emergency response was characterized as disorganized and pandemonium, so much so that the crime scene was contaminated and destroyed, resulting in the loss of important forensic evidence linking the victim and assailant. Staff were described as traumatized and inadequately prepared by academy and institutional training. Elementary chain of command procedures were not followed. Evidence bags were not secured. Even blood evidence from Blaylock's hands was neither examined nor preserved. Incredibly, no evidence log, no incident log was ever made. Additionally, it was noted that prison officials had failed to adequately address Blaylock's known mental health issues. The March 2005 Board of Corrections report, augmented by input from the New York DOC Commissioner Glenn S. Gord, concluded unremarkably that CIM was overcrowded, that the best should have been distributed earlier when they arrived, and that Blaylock should have been placed in administrative segregation when he was processed in. More to the point, all of the above reports generally labeled CIM as being in complete disarray 
and solely in need of an immediate change in leadership. Secretary Hickman ordered a thorough review of the remaining 32 California prisons and a youth authorities. Under increasing pressure, he subsequently designed on February 26th of 06. And that, that concludes this article, man, but wow, it kind of bounced around a little bit. Damn. Who wrote it? Who wrote the article? Huh? Who wrote the article? Oh, man, it was... Uh... This is from the Prison Legal News, and it is by an individual named Marvin Mentor, published in December, or excuse me, November of 2006. Talk about talk about a journalist trying to give everybody their side of the story. Yeah, he, come, he was he supporting covered, everybody. Up. He was supporting everybody, man. I think that there's a couple things I noticed that uh, to give the viewers a better understanding. Of those those that remember this time era, um, I think he may have been housed in Chino. Because based upon that time, that was a reception center. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the only thing that can make sense for someone having 350 some points, man, or whatever. That's a lot of points, man. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? You go, I mean, I don't know Most how much. I've ever had was 50, but yeah, 51. I had a hundred and something at the end. You know what I mean? Um, but so I'm just trying to grasp some things that, 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 you know, you get two sides to the story, man. First, the, the CD, CDCR, right? Their, their standpoint it was in the beginning. And it was almost like they tried to blame the officer Rodriguez, right? That was his name. You know what I'm saying? Was, um, it was o almost like they were trying to do so to avoid a lawsuit. You know what I mean? Self justify that he was coddling inmates and giving them access to this. And that man, they were trying to cover for, for. They were trying to cover basically from a lawsuit from the family man. That's the only thing I could see from. Hey, it. real quick. The thing was, if that dude was coddling, he wouldn't have got hit. They didn't. You're not yeah. just going to hit somebody who helps you out. You know what I mean? If, if he's letting you wiggle and hustle, you're going to get somebody else. So that Didn't was just him to, being how, crazy. How many, how many of those, okay, and this is another part, right? How many issues, okay, I get he probably had some issues with some peace officers. They say attempted murder. I mean, socking a peace officer, sometimes they can consider attempted murder if you heard him. I mean, we know how they, they try to build up charges. So the one thing I'm looking at, right, is he got the help of not just one person, but two people. So when I see that, my whole perspective, okay, of the whole situation is, is this dude was targeted out. They planned, they prepared, and there was a reason behind it. So all the other stuff, the mental health stuff, the past uh, uh, issues with cops, I get it. He probably doesn't like police officers, but even I've met a lot of dudes that don't like police officers, but they know how to be respectful towards officers that do their job, you know what I'm saying, and how to avoid confrontation. I mean, for some reason, you're right, man, you know, when it comes from my past experience, I knew uh, Seville, you know what I mean? Uh, he was a Compton Crip, man. This dude used to get off with the cops all the time, man. I mean, he had a complete hatred. They would come with like four correction officers just to get him out the fucking cell. This dude was a big monster dude, man. You have the issue that happened over there in Calipatria, you know what I mean? When they when they rushed cent, cent, uh, uh, Center Complex, you know what I'm saying? The Crips. So all those dudes ended up in Corcoran shoe, and they gave them a, a, a bus beat, and they gave them a straight welcoming when they got there, man. So the Crips have always been ones to get off. And I don't know if it's, you know, a lot of it could come from their environment where they're from, Los Angeles, man. Los Angeles went through a lot of corruption with the, with the LAPD. From the Rampart scandal to all the bullshit. The 80s, and 90s, have, really. all the way up until recently you know with all the cameras and social media, really. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a common hate in those communities for LAPD. You know what I'm saying? So I can naturally understand, you know, why we hear so much with Crips. Because when you think of the gangs down south, right? African American gangs. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of blood hoods out there. There's a lot of riders that are bloods, man. But I would have to say the Crips are the majority as far as the African African communities out there. You know what I'm saying? I therefore, would... therefore they have numbers. You know, you want to ask, you know, Sudanos Sudanos have been known to get off with cops too. Crips have been known. Not so much whites and not so much North Daniels. And I think a lot of times when you when you think about North Daniels, the reason why they don't get off with cops as much as because the attention and heat that could cause from it, the ripple effects. And where North Daniels are already low in numbers, you know and saying? they don't we'll like be, us to begin with. You know what I mean? We'll be subject to, to further consequences. You know what I mean? If you're in a yard with only 12 people, you can't come rush a cop. Make sure you know you rush two cops, you lose the whole fucking yard. Where if you have about 80, 90, 90 heads in the yard, 150 heads in the yard, you get off with the cops. You're still going to have your homeboys out there in the yard. You're still going to have some type of firm establishment, man. Because I used to remember, man, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's 
like I said, the Africanos are the ones who majority of the times get off with the cops, man. And, and, and a lot of times, you know I mean? It's not even them provoking it. I mean, some have have a little, you know, a hair in their ass. They're, they're ready to get off and pull that trigger. You know what I mean? But I've seen a lot of times, man, uh, uh, where abuses are kind of directed towards them at times. I don't know if it's a racial thing. I don't know if it's a past bad experience. I don't know. We can draw all kinds of different uh, uh, theories here, man. They just get off. You know what I mean? That's just common knowledge. Crips are known to get off with administration, man. And, and I used to always have respect because at that time I was so anti-system, so anti-cop back then, man, that, you know, I used to respect them and kind of, you know, look at them favorably because they did take action. You know what I'm saying? Only thing that they didn't do as much was they didn't push that paper, though. Yeah. They didn't file the 602. So they would, every time you go to the hole, where, you know, you'd run into a crip in the hole. What are they in there for? Getting off on staff over and over again, man. So in this story, man, you know, not that I agree with any correctional officer, you know, you know, dying or anybody dying. I'm not, I'm not trying to promote any type of violence, but the reality of it is you're in a volatile environment where it's just going to happen. If you mistreat people who already don't want to be there, you know what I'm saying? You're subject to consequences. Eventually, someone that's doing a live sentence already for being in there for, for an yeah, issue of attempted murder on a peace officer, yeah. he's doing 75 years to life. What does he got to lose? Nothing. You know what I mean? And all these other incidents, he's probably had about 20 other incidents, and let's, let's look at that, too. So, if he did have allegedly 20 uh, incidents, right, which I believe this news article probably was embellished, you know what I'm saying? To make him look bad and look like he's mental health and you know what i mean try to cater to the cdc and that they put all the protections in anymore and that he should have never been there to try to cover themselves right um let's just say he did have a bunch of incidents right who's to say he doesn't have about one or two situations to where he was beaten till he almost died and he has that much hatred towards cops because of other cops past actions that as soon as he gets in a situation to where he can take action and he feels disrespected he takes action on the cop. Okay. This dude allegedly had a long history of, of activity. Yeah, you know, and even if we were able to, you know, somehow get a copy of a C file, none of that would be in there. It would just be all about him being disruptive and being an aggressor. It wouldn't be like CO such and such and CO such and such threw his boot on the floor or, you know, walk by and whisper the N word at him. It could be anything, bro. You know what I mean? You can't play with people in prison. You know what I mean? And most of the guards do know that. And most see the I always liked the way that, that we got down at, as under under our umbrella, because when you limit interactions and, and you don't have any type of relationships or anything, you kind of just pass by each other like like nothing. You know, with some groups who like to sit there and, and, and maybe chop it up with the female staff trying to run game or you know, they want to talk shit about F the police this and F the police that. That's going to lead to steady interactions and every interaction is not always going to be positive. You know what I mean? So you develop a lot of animosity toward each other, you know, with the continued button of heads and button of heads. Whereas if you just walk right by them, it stays even, you know what I mean? And that's what we always look for was just, Hey, treat us the same way we treat you. Give us what we're allowed to have according to your guys' rules. You know what I mean? And we won't call you out your name. We won't do none of this. We won't do none of that. And you, you know, you don't hear too often about the homies, the northerners getting beat up by the police, taken off on the police because there's no interaction to cause any kind of disdain for one another. Yeah, it could be. It so could, every it group's be. different, you know? Yeah, and the, the, the grips are really, really ready to push them buttons, bro. You know what I'm saying? But see, with us, right, if someone takes action, it could jeopardize the whole car. Exactly. The, re the repercussions aren't, aren't going to be good. So, therefore, like, I've seen homeboys be disciplined, man. I mean, I've had to chew people out on the tier sometimes, man, just because of their actions on the tier, man. Like, hey, we got a canine on the tier. I'm like, hey, you know what I'm saying? You can't call him a canine on the tier. You're disrespecting him by calling him a canine. You're calling him a fucking dog. Yeah. Little shit like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's why we always try to emphasize having a professional manner. And, th therefore... If we don't engage in these issues, we're not going to have no issues. You know what I'm saying? We already know the cops are going to attack us. We already know the cops that have hostilities. We already know all that stuff, man. We just don't have to deal with them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, let's just remember, though, man, like, during that time era, the 90s, you know, this is in the 2000s, but I'm thinking of the 90s, man. It was common for them to sit there and give you elevator rides, you know, in the in Santa Clara County Jail. Man, I got, 
I got beat up. You know what I mean? You know, it was common for for inmates, for guards to run up in an inmate and, and you know, what I mean, go in there eight deep, and next thing you know, he's in the hospital, he's in the infirmary. That kind of stuff really happened back in the days, man. So the things that occur now with all the body cams that are starting to be on these these yards and you know, uh, more attention, man. People are lucky nowadays compared to how we have it, man. I mean, it was pretty bad back then, bro. Yeah. I haven't seen so much of it in prison. I, w- I mean, in Susanville, man, like like you were saying about the white dudes, man, I've seen a lot of them get cell extracted, but that was like the farthest it would go. You know what I mean? That's how they would protest, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word. They I would didn't like this part, bro. What I didn't like, and I think you're going to agree, and I think this is something that needs to be brought attention. I don't know if they do this anymore. I don't like how they used to sell extract people that had mental health issues. Now they dealt with that, right? And I'm seeing a lot of that because I was in the regular shoe, and I've seen people that had mental issues that were fucking like put beasties all over themselves. And, you know what I mean? They had to have those little bags because they spit on cops. And, and just, it would be something pa- smitty, uh, petty and small, and, they, and a lot of times the guards would provoke it. And they would look for issues. Next thing you know, they're doing a cell extraction. I mean, them cell extractions, man, pepper spray everywhere in the whole pod, man. I mean, it affects everybody, yeah. you know? Next thing you know, you see the dude, he has a broken arm and, or he's, you know, in a cast and has a neck brace and stuff, man. I mean, them cops did not play back then. I don't think people realize it, man. They were treacherous, man. They the were electric against- shields, they come in with the electric shield. <laughs> oh, man, they had the electric shields, you know what I mean? And, you know, they, they would go through that whole process, man, and like bringing it, they'd have to bring in a psych and they bring in a psych and just have the psych go to the door. Okay, he said, no, come on, let's go. You know what I mean? And just look for any reason to hit the tear gas, to spray the whole thing. And next thing you know, th- that whole goon squad would just be ready to go up in there, man. And you'd hear the dude say, I'm done, I'm done, right? Man, they're still whooping the shit out. They're getting the extra kicks, the extra batons, all that stuff, the shield in the face. And you know what I mean? It was no joke back then, bro. You know yeah, I mean, I had it. I had it one time because I flipped out, bro. When they when they 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 rolled they rolled me up for attempted attempted a uh, uh, murder, right? Uh, slicing, and fucking, I was already looking at time for a drive by shooting, so I started flipping out on them. I fucking, I was a young kid, bro. I started headbutting the fucking window and cussing out the cops to come get me. They came in there, bro. And then they they man brought me on that elevator. They whooped the shit out of me. They put the shackles afterwards all the way fucking up right here, right to where fucking. My pants were halfway down, and it was going through the back part. They did all this fucking weird shit tight, man, and it was the fucking worst fucking feeling, man. I mean, they were opening the fucking door, and before it was open, they'd act like they were trying to push me out, hit my head against the wall. Oh, oops, sorry. And I was beat up, man. Next thing you know, I was fucking on. That's how I ended up on the sixth floor back then in 6B with fucking Chuko and all them, you know? I seen I seen way more uh, guard on, on inmate violence in the county jail systems than ever in prison. You know what I mean? I used to be a uh, the damn uh, intake worker in Contra Costa for a while. So I clean up all the, the holding yeah. cells and all that shit. And people come in there. I think I might have told the story before, but people come in there high, thinking they're tough, yelling at the cops because they've been sitting in intake for 15, 20, 30 hours. And then they start dropping the punks and bitches and I'll fuck you ups and this and that. And I'm just like, hey, I'm sweeping. I'm like, hey, brother, I ain't trying to tell you what to do. I'm not on their side, but if you don't stop, they're going to beat you to death, bro. Oh, oh, F the police. Man, I ain't scared of them. Next thing you know, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, I try to tell them, bro, hey, you know, you come off the streets, alcohol, drugs, mad because, man, you feel like you're in there for some bullshit, whatever. Bro. This is not, this is not going to work out good for you. You keep yelling at it. You call, and then they start calling the nurses and stuff. That's when they really trip out. When, when, when the inmates would direct it at free staff. Oh, bro. Them cops would be in there. So oh, yeah. they got them six foot nine, big old Iowa white dudes, bro. You know, and they're just in there. <laughs> bro, you know what I'm saying? I'm Which just like, Oh, that's nasty. Sweeping the floor. What do you think? I, can, I remember when this incident happened because they locked us down, right? I, I was I was in the shoe at that time. Um, what do you think uh, was the cause of it, though? The cause of what? This this hit this officer this like right here. Yeah, personally, like just the perspective. My perspective would probably be that he didn't get along with that particular cop. 
you know, we targeted him, you know. Um, there's two – I think there's only two possibilities. One, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to smash on a cop for whatever reason. And two, or either two, he just didn't like that dude, that particular correctional officer for whatever reason. The fact that they had two other people be involved implicated in it, right? It just yeah. goes to show, you know what I mean? Allegedly, let's go allegedly. We don't know the, the, we don't even know the results of this case, right? We should look that up as a matter of fact. But the, the since they allegedly had two people involved, man, that just goes to show for me that this was premeditated as far as uh, it was planned for whatever reason, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, could it have um, been any cop or did it have to be this one? That's the only thing I can't figure out. I think it probably was was targeted out. Me too. You know what I'm saying, Me based too. upon the fact, like, you know, okay, look, you know, within our people, right? I don't know how these other groups function, right? But you're not going to provide a piece just to anybody. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, just to give to anybody to go over there and, and use it. You know what I'm saying? So for two people to make a piece, the first thing I'm going to do before I make a piece, I'm going to wonder what the hell you. If you're not making a piece on your own and you need me to make you a piece, what do you need it for? You know I'm saying because you're involving me. Because I don't know if you're going to use that to attack me. You know what I'm saying? That's going to be my first question. Different though, too. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I don't know how they operate on that, man. Because a lot of times they don't even have pieces. That's the thing. You know what I mean? So a lot, uh, most, a lot of the, except for the old school ones, a lot of them know how to make pieces. But a lot of the younger ones, not. They're not as uh, uh, used to manufacturing pieces like we are. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of questions with this article. I think that I think it's weird because I think part of it in the beginning, I thought they were trying to get funding. Right. You know what I'm saying? Then part of it, I think they were trying to uh, uh, cover for, for a lawsuit. You know what I'm saying? And then part of it, they were saying, if they were, it's just weird. This article was kind of a... Uh, uh, yeah, it went a lot of different directions. Yeah, Another yeah, thing I yeah. wanted to say is that is the medical care when we went there. Man, hey, if... Man, if you didn't make an ass out of yourself, kicking on the door, making threats, you probably weren't seeing medical for a considerable amount of time, man. And that's just how oh, it was. Yeah. They said six to seven unnecessary inmate deaths. It's like, what was it, a week, they said, or a month, whatever? It's too many, bro. Well, you know what, you though, too? Know, there, it's, it's now the state's responsibility to take care of your medical. Yeah, you're in there as a criminal. You can't be denied medical, though. I get it. You're in there fighting a crime, but you're in there as consequences, man. But that's not... That starts to get into cruel and unusual. That's, you know, you've got, you got a torn that, shoulder, a torn rotator cuff or something. Man, you shouldn't have to sit in pain for three weeks before you see medical. I'm going to I'm have to believe that's correctional staff negligence. I really am. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I've seen people talk about they're hurting and, and they're, they have this and that and they want to go see a doctor. And then, the, and then if the person keeps on bugging and bugging, they ain't got shit coming. You know what I'm saying? You know, you're supposed to be given adequate adequate medical treatment, period. So, I mean, that's that's always going to be grounds for a lawsuit. Anytime, anytime improper care, negligence or everything, the whole thing that they do, though, is that they have such procedures to go about it, man. They try to find ways to cover from lawsuits when these occur. You know what I'm saying? We were just enforcing policy. So what ends up happening there is... Becomes the end a policy of, change. It becomes a policy change, man. That's a... That's a they're going to do everything they can not to have to pay no money out every time, you know? Anyway, here's today's lesson, man. You don't go to prison. You can go to the doctor whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, real talk though, man, you don't got to deal with these kind of situations. Don't do what you're supposed to do in society, man. Get a job, take care of your family, educate yourself. And you won't face none of these messed up conditions, man. You know, prison is supposed to be a good place. It is a punishment. Let's not forget it. But they don't care about basic human decency at some points in time. Not all of them. I'm not saying that. I don't have nothing personal against any CO, judge, district attorney. They're not the reason I'm in prison. But at the same time, it's not a place you want to go, bro. There's nothing good about it. So that's today's lesson from your boy Rojo and Big Flacco, Convict's Perspective. Let us know what you think of this article, and we'll be back at you probably tonight with the live. We appreciate you. Have a good rest of your Tuesday.